So we, we shot the film August, September of last year and took our entire cast and crew down to Southeast Texas. And <laughs> Every time. Every night. Every night. <laughs> and Q&A um, last night. Happened. But yeah, we lived down there for several months and um, the beautiful thing about it was that the community came out in full force to really support the film and be a part of the film from being extras to donating locations to bringing food to set. It was just a, a, a beautiful a beautiful experience of the people being so integral to the film and, and the story. And that was Port Arthur, Bolivar, Beaumont. Nederland, Groves, Port Natchez, uh, Baytown. I feel like there's just like, <laughs> it keeps going. Yeah. Like the whole area. <coughs> yeah. One of the things as I was watching this film, I saw 30 films at South by Southwest, and this was one of the last ones I saw because I had missed the interview with Kat and I think I grabbed you right as you were getting ready to leave. I was like, I need to talk to you before I leave and before you leave. But um, the scene that really spoke to me in the film was, she and I talked to the, the, about this at length, but the, the scene where Hollis goes and cleans up the house. He, he, uh, make, he does the laundry, he cleans the kitchen, and it's almost, he sits there as if, you know, okay, I'm, I'm fixing things. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was such a great metaphor of how he finally goes and tries to clean up this place and thinks that that's the start of something. Right. And you talked to me a little bit about how, why you put that in there, and so tell them a little bit about the metaphors that you use there. Oh, wow, now I'm trying to think of what well, I told you. Just about, <laughs> just about Please let it be as smart and intelligent <laughs> as what I said. That Josh's character okay. thought if he could win that race, that yeah, would fix yeah, things. Yeah, yeah. If he could yeah. clean Absolutely. the apartment, that that would fix things. Yeah, I mean, And they just, kind of functioned in that, that, oh, if I could just do this, you know, I can get there. And right, yeah, I mean, the, the, the beautiful thing about us as human beings is that we're so fallible and, and we're continuing to make mistakes as we try to make things better. And, and yeah, that was, you know, if I, if I throw away all the beer and I, I do the laundry, that this is going to change things. And yeah, with Josh, or with Jacob's character, if I win this race, everybody's going to know that I'm, a, I, I'm responsible and I can do this and I'm going to bring my brother home. But yet, that's not going to fix everything. It's a, gra it's a continual effort throughout our, our entire lives. And in the film, after that scene, it's almost like it gets worse. After they do those things, or he fails, you know, yeah. it's almost like it really falls apart then because they were, they held that up so high, as, if I could just do that, and it doesn't happen, and then it almost gets worse. Yeah, well, it's, it's Jacob finally using his voice and, like, expressing what he's been going through this whole time and just kind of kept so, uh, just so um, regressed within himself, I guess. Just letting it pour out. Yeah. Thinking about it. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he knows. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the things, I didn't get to talk to him at South by Southwest, West, but one of the things I wanted to talk to you about was, was it uncomfortable doing that like emotional breakdown scene in the pizza thing? Because, you know, it's not just that you're acting with your, the four actors. Uh -huh. You've got a whole audience yeah, yeah, there, yeah. not to mention the film crew. I mean, was that difficult for you? Yeah. As I mean, I was definitely, like, the entire, from day one, I was like, when are we doing the... Pizza Hut scene, as it came to be known yeah. as, yeah. infamously the Pizza Hut scene. I mean, did you dread that, or was that like an yeah, adrenaline yeah. rush? I was. Or? I kept asking her, like, I did not want to do it at all. Yeah. But um, I mean, at that point, you get really comfortable with the crew and you know, with your cast, and you get encouraged to go to these places, and you feel like it's okay to go to these places. But uh, the the thirty extras in the room didn't help. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> or we you know, the part where I say, um, "Fuck all you." <laughs> <laughs> One of the extras laughed after I said that. <laughs> it didn't help the feeling, but you know, I mean, it's it's acting, you know. And it's, you're comfortable with everyone that you're with, and it makes it, you know, that much more rewarding. Yeah. Well, one last question, then I'll ask. I'll let them ask some questions. But for you guys, I mean, what was it like working with Kat? I mean, I've talked to her off and on for the past couple of months, and she seems just like she knows what she wants and what she's doing. I mean, what did you guys learn from working with her that I mean, you took away? Yeah, I mean, Kat always encouraged, like I said, to not be afraid to go to these places. And Kat, um, she really connected with this because I always say that Kat is a 12-year-old in a however old she's body. <laughs> <laughs> She gets grilled cheese and all that stuff, yeah. So, I mean, she connects with kids really well. She understands kids. She's, you know, she's all about that. So it was, it was much easier to kind of get in the groove of things. Lance. <laughs> well, this was my first ever acting, like, at all. So I went from no knowledge at all to everything I need to know to pursue. And she taught us a lot from the basics to, you know, Whatever else comes after the basics. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> I didn't spend a lot of time with her. I spent one day, all day with her. Um, <laughs> but I've worked with a lot of different directors, and I prefer uh, a director to you know speak softly and encouraging. <laughs> and I've had directors yell at me. I don't really respond well to that. Uh, but she was very encouraging, and and you know our conversations were between between her and I uh, about the scene. And uh, yeah, I, I think we had a nice nice chemistry there. I mean, amazing. <laughs> I, I, I keep telling people that everything I do after this, I'm spoiled because she's the best. And anybody else that I work with after this, as far as directors, like, no one can be as nice and as sweet. And it was amazing. It was my first feature as well. So, and with her too. And I'll, I'm, because this one has been with me from the very, like, pretty much the beginning. And for those of you guys who don't know, an assistant editor, it's on set, logging all the footage, organizing all of the footage, and then in the edit, like co you're just like constantly, constantly, constantly. I mean, she's been working up until like <laughs> yesterday, maybe, <laughs> as we're like getting the ready, the movie to go out to like different markets and so forth. Like she's just been like by my side for many, many, many months. So I've asked her a bunch of questions already, and you guys have just seen it. So does anybody have any questions about the story, the making of the film, for the actors? I've got a question, Kat. Uh, yeah. Can you just tell us a little bit about the choice in music, mm -hmm. setting the tone for the story? Yeah, so the, the short film had a heavy metal soundtrack uh, as well. And it, you know, it's just the very externalization of the, the internal anger of these boys and the rage that's kind of um, just kind of simmering within them. Uh, and then, it, A, it's a dream soundtrack, like, I got to work with Metallica in Slayer, and Lauren Micus, whose family is here, uh, she was our music supervisor, and, you know, the big guns, like, I was like, Metallica was my first and foremost, like, dream to work with, and then she brought, brought great uh, bands as well, like, we all knew the sword, but she had a personal connection to them and was able to get them on board. And then uh, someone here last night was actually asking about D.Y., the, um, the rapper who's in, who's Wes's favorite band. And like, I had never, never heard any of his stuff. And she brought all of this wonderful music to the table to really like kind of figure out. And it was really cute with that particular song. Um, I think she had brought like three of his songs to the table and all the boys, we were sitting in like the conference room trying to figure out which song was going to be his song. And so we played each one of them for him and it was the one where he was like, oh my god, that's sick. And we're like, okay, <laughs> that's the song Deep that he's going Yeah, it was the deep stamp of approval. But then also the, you know, what I love, love, love and, um, you know, it's one of the things that people don't talk about a lot is the sound and the music kind of meshing together. And we had a really um, kind of new experience with that. Our sound designer is from Skywalker, and we were fortunate to get a grant to work with Skywalker. And he came down to Port Natchez with me for like two or three days, and we just collected all of the refineries from all over the city. Um, and there was one point like I lost him, and he was down by the shipyards collecting like the clanging of the metal. And then he brought all of these sounds back to Austin, where we're all from and um, sat with the composer for about a week, exchanging the metal clanging to like Curtis with instrumentations that he'd kind of come up with. And they created this um, beautiful soundscape that the first scene that they did this to was the one where Hollis goes to the beach house and there's the foreclosure sign and there has this sort of storm-like quality to it. So we always were talking about the hurricanes, the storms, the weather in that area being kind of a template for the design, which it's very, very rare that a composer and a sound designer collaborate. Usually like the sound comes at the very end and the, compo and the, uh, the score comes at the very end and they have to kind of figure it out. But um, it was a beautiful, beautiful collaboration with those guys from the beginning that I'm, it's just a very kind of progressive process. I actually caught the the hurricane mention early on when uh, Jacob's watching TV. And there was the warning on the television. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I've never called you in the back. Oh, you um, <laughs> the visual style is very deliberate. It's very mm -hmm. specific. The you know, shallow depth of field, the mm -hmm. very close up angles, and the um, shaky nature of the camera. What yeah. what motivated that for you? What in all the different directions you could go? Why why that? 
I always knew that I wanted um, the camera work to have a little bit of frenetic energy, kind of to piggyback on the boys and sort of their wild nature. Um, so yeah, we never had a, a tripod, even though we rented one and paid for one. We never <laughs> used it, um, but that was always intentional to have, and 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 not do like the crazy like Blair Witch kind of shaky cam. But <laughs> again, even like the slightest kind of bit of movement feeling a little bit more intimate and a little bit more um, energetic with these kids. Was that natural light? Yeah, that, I mean, it's a great question. We, we, um, that was the other thing, yeah, as much natural light as possible, just again, kind of create this naturalistic feel to the film. We shot on an Alexa, so you don't have to like crazy over light everything. And the other thing about that too, with like, specifically with the boys, three of which had never acted in a film before, you're trying to create a play, like a space for them not to feel like like towering lights yeah. everywhere and like it's confined. Not dollies and all yeah, that. Yeah, you just, and that was the beautiful thing about Brett, who was our DP. He had worked on a film called Short Term 12, which is like a phenomenal film, and the performances in that are just stunning. And he's, he's just, he's really, he's beautiful with actors and be able to give them this space to kind of work and grow and, um, yeah. Anybody else? How many uh, shoot days did you guys have? How many days did you? Yeah, so we shot for 26 days uh, down in Southeast Texas, which, you know, working with kids, you're limited to how many hours you can shoot a day, so it was really, really tight. Um, I would have loved to have one extra day, um, but these guys were so incredible, so like every day I was getting what I wanted, and it, I never felt like I left a day not like, ah, oh, I wish I could have gotten the shot, or I wish we had had more time for this performance. Um, it was just really, like, things just beautifully fell into place performance-wise. These guys just really killed it. I'm so, so freaking proud of them. Um, but yeah, it was, it was, def I could have used one more day. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? Any more questions? You want to tell them a little bit? Okay. okay. Where, where, where was the mother in the story? Yeah. I, I missed um, where she was. Yeah. Is it an it accident? I couldn't really tell. The White Cross maybe think a car accident. Yeah. But yeah. It seemed to be right in front of their big house they were building. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. No, you get you're up totally on the right yeah. track. And it's interesting too because when you take the when we've taken the film to other states because Texas you know you see so many of these crosses yeah. on the side of the road and there are other states where it's not um, as much as prominent. Um, but yeah, car accident, you're totally on track. And the thing is too, like you, for me personally, I, I try and lean a little bit more on the t side of subtlety and try not to like just kind of force speed what's happening and hopefully throughout the film you're picking up these kind of little clues and things are kind of unfolding and um, kind of figuring things out. But yeah, you're totally right. <laughs> Any more questions? Um, since you were working on such a tight schedule, mm -hmm. how much uh, room did you have to improvise or like add elements that were in the script? Yeah, I'll let these guys talk yeah. about that. Uh, <laughs> that, uh, that bike shop scene, that was like 90% improv. Um, was there a script on that? That's definitely yeah. Really <laughs> 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 no, um, I mean, we talked about the party, like that's a rich kid's party, but. She encouraged us to improv that scene because it's supposed to be, you know, just kids talking. And every time we improv it, it kept going back to Lauren Landon. So we just build on that. <laughs> That's kind of how that started. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I, I would say like a couple of the scenes with the boys was heavily improv, and then the kitchen scene with the adult boys uh, was definitely improv as well. But outside of that, I would say a good portion of it was scripted. Um, a lot of Aaron and Juliet's scenes and non like boys group scenes are all pretty pretty script based. Do you want to tell them a little bit how um, you kind of got Aaron and Julia into these parts because you, yeah. said you really weren't thinking about when you were adapting it from the short film to the narrative who was going to play that and right. kind of tell them how they came into the picture. Yeah, so as I was as I write scripts, I don't usually have actors in my head cuz by the time you get to finishing it, there's just a, a million different ways and you can go. And um, I had actually seen a, a movie called Smashed in Austin at the Violet Crown. This movie with Mary Elizabeth Winstead directed by James Ponzel. It's just a beautiful, honest uh, performed film. And um, 
at that point I had only seen two episodes of Breaking Bad. I got to that defining bathtub episode in season one and then just kind of stopped. Um, and uh, after I saw Smashed, my husband's like, you gotta go back. And so I binged like all weekend on Breaking Bad. And I just, I was so enamored by Aaron and um, and sort of the the range that he had. And then the idea of him playing a character I'd never seen before on screen was really exciting. And he was, you know, sort of uh, ending this beloved series. And it was like, what was he gonna do next? Um, so I, I reached, I sent him the script uh, through his agency. And then also I know James who directed Smash who reached out to him as well. And uh, about a week later, I was, uh, he was, we were scheduling me to come up to Macon, Georgia, where he was shooting me for speed, and we sat over milkshakes and uh, talked about life and histories and the story and the character. And then after he got on board, uh, the script was circulating through his agency, which is also Juliet's agency, and so we got a call <coughs> from her agent, and she was interested in the project, so then I was eating omelets with Juliet in LA <laughs> when she came on board. Um, but yeah, I, what I loved was both of these actors, it was a chance to see something very, very different for both of them, and they're just, they're such phenomenal, phenomenal talents. So yeah, so getting to work with them was awesome. <laughs> well, that's all I've got, unless anyone has anything else. Why, uh, why Swiss Family Robinson? Oh, Shipwrecked Family. Trying to kind of come back together and survive. Yeah. There was one point um, in earlier drafts where uh, there were more books that he was reading. He was reading Lord of the Flies at one point, and um, there were a few more scenes with Wes on, kind of on his own. But in the end, I just really I loved the idea of sort of the shipwrecked family with him. Um, it was really cute because uh, these boys had homework assignments every so often, um, and I remember assigning Deke, who plays Wes. Uh, at first, I was going to assign him to read the book, but there was a limited amount of time, so he ended up watching the the movie, and he was just like, "Oh, I have homework to do." And I'm like, "Yeah, you're going to watch a movie." <laughs> and then he came back, and he was just like, "Oh my God, that movie was so good!" And I'm like, "Yeah." Really <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but yeah. Kat, uh, I've had the pleasure of enjoying some of your short films thanks to the Houston Film Commission. Yeah. Can you tell people how to find those films online? Yeah, um, so the Hellion short, and I had a short last year called Black Metal that was on the festival circuit, which is what I'm actually working on expanding right now into a feature. Both of those are available on Fandor.com, uh, which is kind of an indie version of Netflix. Uh, and then I have a short film called Love Bug, which is totally different from everything else. <laughs> um, it's a kids' comedy. Um, and that, I think, is just on YouTube or Vimeo or something like that. But yeah, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> well, and if you want to read the interview with Kat and I, we're going to go a little bit deeper into yeah. this. Um, that article um, is on texasartandfilm.com. It's on the main header, so yeah. you can catch that interview. And I just want to say thank you guys again so much for coming out because our again our independent films are so small and we we need audiences like you guys if you liked the film please 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 social media facebook twitter whatever i don't need flickster i, yeah, I don't know what they are like in, on VOD too. yeah oh yeah and it's on vod and itunes if you have friends that don't live in areas but we'll be rolling out all summer long across the country um but yeah we we, we couldn't make uh, with films without you guys coming to see them. So thank you guys so much for showing up.